U.S. farmers and ranchers in action would like to recognize the sponsors of the 2020 Honor the Harvest Forum. Welcome to Farm Food Facts for Thursday, November 5th, 2020. I'm your host, Phil Lempert. There's so much to celebrate with all the new partnerships, the confrontational collaboration, thanks to Polly Ruhlman at USB for that term, and focus on the next 30 harvests to create climate smart, prosperous agriculture here in the United States. As marketers deeply invested in food and agriculture, we believe that there's even more energy and more opportunity to be gained by leveraging the untapped power of consumer engagement. And on these initiatives in particular, at this time in particular, it's critical. There are large eager customer and consumer audiences that are ready to recognize these efforts and celebrate the brands that invest in sustainable supply chain innovations in support of farmers and ranchers, and most important, the larger environment. Bader Rudder is one of USFRA's important partners to achieve these goals and help continue to spread the work and the words from Honor the Harvest. Beta Rudder is the country's largest agriculture marketing agency. And through nearly 50 years of steady growth, they've dreamed really big. They've planned really big and meticulously and fiercely championed their client success. Joining us today on Farm Food Facts is Jody George and Dennis Ryan, who lead the Beta Rudder food and beverage practice, which is focused on creating consumer and customer brand value from supply chain sustainability investments. Jody has worked for 20 years across all food and agriculture marketing and strategies for America's largest food and agriculture companies. She brings her diverse knowledge and passion to creating a very sustainable, innovative path for food and agriculture producers, for brands, and most important for consumers. Dennis has spent the better part of his extensive career telling stories for food and beverage brands from every major company in the space. After building an enviable TV-centric CPG advertising career in Chicago, he moved to Minneapolis to learn digital, social, and one-to-one marketing skills. Jody, let's get started. What are food and ag companies focused on and what are the questions that they should be asking themselves right now? Well, I think food and agriculture companies, Phil, are focused on a lot of the right things. You know, for the first time in my 20 year career across food and agriculture, we have so much strong alignment between what consumers are asking for and actions the supply chain and these companies are taking around sustainability. Now what's missing is in the middle, and it's about adopting a marketer's mind to link those two ends of the spectrum with the right creative and investment that will really create value. So the questions that that food and agriculture companies should be asking themselves are, am I investing in the right way? Do I have really... um, the right investment when it comes to sustainability and corporate communications? And are they partnering with brand marketers who are creating value for consumers? That is by far the biggest question that we think food and agriculture companies should be asking today. So if I asked you the same question a year ago, pre-pandemic, would you have the same answer for me? Oh, that's a good question. I think, you know, I'd have a fairly similar answer. However, we think that the opportunities to create this value are much more aligned than they were a year ago. So I think that a year ago, it would have been a little bit farther out. Maybe some of these partnerships around sustainability wouldn't have been created. Consumers wouldn't have been looking and learning about the supply chain and be so invested so in a way, there's no better time than now. And that's one, one thanks we have to give to COVID uh, on a very short list. Right. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with that. Um, you know, consumers are asking more questions than ever before um, about the supply chain. They, they see these, you know, horrible news stories, um, everything from dumping of milk to, to you know, uh, crops rotting in the fields and so on. Um, is is today's consumer being driven by fear uh, 
are they, are they being driven by interests? Uh, what's, what's driving this newfound desire to learn more about our food supply? Well, I wouldn't say it's fear, Phil. I mean, obviously, that can be part of it. And we all know in the great online search for clicks, fear can be an activator and get a lot of uh, engagement. I think what they're really drawn by are values. And, you know, in a commoditized world, when you have three choices that are not really demonstrably that different, which one stands for which one aligns with you better? And I think particularly in the younger generation's awareness of climate issues, of worker issues, of just human health, that that is why I think this is now the time where we're at a pretty good inflection point for them being informed in these choices and having that drive consumer decisions. So Dennis, you're one of the ultimate food storytellers. You often tell the industry that if they've checked their brands and backstories, uh, they better be sure of it. Uh, what does a brand backstory really mean and how should they go about it? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, Phil, we all have this. This is our little smartphones with us. It's always at the end of our hand. Right there is a repository of information about anything I want to look up. So really, it's almost a matter of corporate hygiene now. What is the online backstory of your company, of your brand? And if there are things, you really have to address them. And so I just think with a more informed populace, more empowered to be informed, they have to be aware and just basically do the maintenance of looking at the stories out there. Are they optimized? Are they, are they positive? And if they're positive, are they optimized? Because the more people share the story for you, you get to really take advantage of the power of recommendation. And that's what we're really seeing. When you feel these consumer movements behind, this is wonderful. We're investing in better ingredients, better sourcing, better better farming methods. These stories get shared and they do help make a difference, not just to me, but to my 10 friends and their 10 friends and so on. So what happens if you know I go online and I'm looking at a story that's not true? or not good. I mean, we've all heard about, you know, the restaurant reviews that come out that destroy a restaurant that, you know, the chef looks at and says, hey, that's not my restaurant. What can a company do if they find negative information, uh, whether it's true or not true, to, to change that backstory? You know, that is increasingly a problem. Frankly, it's created a whole new industry. Um, people like Crisp do out are out there searching the social channels looking for this misinformation or kind of a lot of times it is intentional and that needs to be found identified and addressed immediately people are aware of the fact that this can be manipulated now and if you're quick enough to react if you're there with a strong powerful rebuttal people will give you credit the problem is when you're not aware of it and it lies and just kind of festers and it becomes spreadable. And there's no doubt certain salacious things or I always knew it kind of uh, emotional plays because we're an emotional, <laughs> we're emotional creatures. And so we're uh, inclined to dudgeon and the high disregard and, you know, we're seeing that. And unfortunately it is not our, not one of our better angels. One of the things so, that we see brands with, very positive online backstories do is raise up those new partnerships, the actions that they're taking. Too often, those facts, the information are buried in press releases, are buried on websites. And so one of the things that we really advise is to bring a marketer's mindset to your sustainability and your corporate communication activities. That's what can unlock a little bit more of that creative storytelling of the investment. So a lot of these examples already exist. It's just bringing a different lens to them and bringing them out of the shadows in some ways. So to be louder there, um, to be ready when there are some of those challenges. So you mentioned press releases. Um, one of probably one of the biggest bugaboos that, that I've got. And you talk about where information is buried, you know, in them and, and they've probably be, been rewritten, you know, by five different executives. So when they come out, nobody really cares um, about them. Um, I want to give you an example and have both of you 
Uh, give me your opinion of this. Uh, just last week, we saw a new partnership between TikTok and Postmates. And what, uh, what they've done, and it's being tested right here in Los Angeles, just till November 22nd, um, what Postmates has done is they've taken the, those TikTok um, videos that have been the most popular. Uh, some have reached 3 billion views, and they've worked with local restaurants um, to offer those recipes, to offer those products. Um, some are simple coffees, some are uh, bento boxes, and, and so on. Um, I, I look at that and I look at uh, people like Walmart that's investing uh, heavily uh, in the U.S. Uh, global uh, TikTok. Um, and, and they talk about how there's a new e-commerce that's going to come, this, this blending, if you would, from having a situation like this where I can just go on Postmates. Uh, by the way, it's free delivery. Um, and I can order this $7.50, you know, coffee. Um, what do you guys think about that idea? Is it a great idea? Is it just PR? Is it, you know, the future? Uh, Jody, why don't you start us off and then Dennis, your opinion. It is absolutely the future. So there's a couple of things that jump out at me from that example. Two is, uh, one is online to offline. So being able to find those trends and really look and utilize TikTok, um, no matter what anybody thinks about TikTok, but really be able to see what is trending and then be able to partner with those restaurants and bring it back to that audience that's already engaged. The other thing that points to are new types of partnerships. So right now, uh, one of the most successful things that we're doing with a couple clients at Beta Rudder is using LinkedIn Lives and Facebook Lives to not just share information, but to use e-com to complete purchases. So something that used to be shared as entertainment, um, just you'd see scrolling through either your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook profile, not only are people are stopping, but we're making it much easier for them to click through and not just gain additional information, but to complete that purchase. So marketing has become with those unique partnerships and online and offline, much more of a sales driver than it ever has been before. And we're going to keep seeing that as we do more online, as we buy more online. And there's more of these unique partnerships and offering that social channels are having. Dennis? Yeah, I would build on that. I'd say, actually, if you look at the TikTok's been advertising on television lately, and they position themselves as an education platform. Think about that. They're saying, hey, you want to learn to make this amazing cupcake? Or, hey, do you want to see how I did this eye makeup? Basically, what's interesting, you watch social media moving from Facebook and Twitter to Instagram, a very visual-based uh, medium, and now to TikTok, which is visual but all video. It's interesting. It's almost like a redo of Vine, but it's got a little more flexibility. Vine might have been a little before its time and a little too isolated, whereas TikTok is broad and appealing. You can publish right away and you can get feedback right away. As a guy who used to make Super Bowl ads for Frito-Lay, and it was great, and we'd finally reach 100 million people. The days of aggregated eyeballs are kind of gone away, but TikTok is really good at getting interesting, interested eyeballs. Here, this might be a little thing about how you, uh, you know, handle a pork shoulder and do a long barbecue smoke. But boy, the barbecue fans will all be watching it, all be sharing it. It will find the perfect audience, and if Coop's mustard decides to affiliate with that, good for them. And what we're really seeing is a breakdown of mass marketing to really more targeted, very niche, that's really enabled by massive platforms with very niche audiences. So I'm going to ask you both the same question. How should farmers and ranchers be using TikTok? Dennis? That's a great question. I think what they have to do is figure out what audience they want to reach and what's their message. It's the it's classic advertising thing. But if you want people to know that you're doing, uh, that you're paying your workers in a different way. Having them tell their story and then finding either making it policy people, kind of relevant to policy people, or as Jody and I keep believing, regular consumer, ad, consumer audiences. Consumers might not sit there and go, gee, I really wonder how they're treating the workforce and if they are getting a, paying a living wage. But you know what, when they hear that, 
they might be motivated if, they, if that's a value that's shared. So if you can find an audience and a value and where that intersects with what you're offering or the innovations you're creating or the science you're putting forward, or the technology, that's really, if you can align any of those sustainability initiatives with values, it doesn't matter because the audience will almost find itself. I will send it to my friend, Phil, who will know exactly the 10 people he wants to send it to. And that's really the power of this kind of, viral is a terrible word, but viral is really the only way to talk about it, kind of audience building. So, you know, I think your, your example of employees, how farmers and ranchers treat employees is a perfect example because we're seeing more and more of that. Um, Jody, what do you think farmers and ranchers should be doing with TikTok? I think anytime we can have a social tool that helps us increase transparency to sustainability actions, employee actions, um, how farmers are helping um, solve hunger challenges in their local communities, um, challenges that they come up against in a daily basis. All of this doesn't need to be sunny. This is real life. That's why these social channels exist. Uh, maybe not Instagram. Let's put a, a caveat on that. Um, but when you think about creating that transparency for consumers, in addition to using those social channels and understanding your audience, one of the things that I've probably changed my perspective on over the past 20 years is don't just share your story, understand who you're sharing it for and what matters to them and what value you're creating. I know so many farmers that in the early days of um, you know, NCBA and Pork Board and, and all of those programs worked so hard and shared, spent so many hours of their time sharing their story, but it wasn't necessarily in a way of how we're using this to build brand value, to build industry value. So making sure there are those coordinated efforts as well. So we're using those farmer and ranchers time, valuable time, really effectively. So let's talk money. Jody, we have a looming recession, uh, dramatically increased costs because of the pandemic. How can the food and ag world deal with all these needs uh, that we're talking about as it relates to communication and, frankly, grow their businesses? Yeah. We'd like to, in, in the sense of confrontational collaboration, um, really challenge food and agriculture companies to link their sustainability and their supply chain and their corporate communication efforts and the people who lead those with their brand teams. We feel that those value creating activities, those new partnerships, the actual facts are being created in the corporate, in sustainability, in supply chain. Marketers are looking for how they create values and brand and uh, flavor extensions aren't gonna cut it anymore. And they're hard to produce when you have a plant where half of them is in quarantine. So if we can link those teams, attach them at the hips and have them think about the stories they wanna tell in the proof and what consumers are looking for, that's how you get more bang for your buck these days in creating a brand. And you know what, I'd be saying that even if we weren't looking at some potentially challenging economic times, because that just is good business and good marketing in this day and age. Well, for all of our, the three of our careers, you know, the, the rule has been for a brand manager, line extension, line extension, line extension. You know, if I've got one product that's great, you know, macaroni and cheese, I'm going to come up with 30 versions of macaroni and cheese. <laughs> or, you know, I've, I've got an olive oil that's successful. I'm going to have 18 different flavored olive oils. Um, so what you're really saying is uh, it's time to get smart. And, and really understand, you know, consumers understand the trends and work together that it's not just um, as a brand manager, you know, if, if I don't screw up, I don't get fired um, right. and, and really get, get out there and do something that, that's interesting. Uh, Dennis, tell us about the Intel Distillery and Friday by Noon email and why it's so important. Well, I, you hit it exactly, Phil. With the Intel Distillery, what we've done is for seven years, every day, I mean, seven days a week, what we do is we follow the 1,500 most influential voices in food. And that can be everyone from who's working on policy to academia to, to chefs and celebrity things. We've got like 10 different 
uh, sectors we cover and we find the most influential voices. Because what we find is when people are writing about, when these leaders are writing about topics, the rest of the market catches up very quickly. They're just the tip of the spear of where the conversations are going. And we take those conversations, we've got a hundred categories and God knows how many subcategories, and we just file them away. And we've been doing this, essentially we've got two databases built up over seven or eight years. And you can see these trends. We just released our Q3 report, you know, where we just look at what's been happening over the quarter. And obviously, as you can imagine, the pandemic's been right. playing a huge role. But, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, how can brand managers get smart? It's like our audience already is. They are so informed. And I think now when we're making these wonderful partnerships, wow, we know that Nabisco decided to partner with farmers who are doing this or, you know, in, in trying to grow in this way. We've all watched how Annie's Organics, uh, you know, bought by General Mills so they could learn more about organics and how they can expand and move from 80,000 acres to how to get 80 million acres. You know, these kind of really large changes that have to happen. Consumers are interested in it. They do find it relevant. And while you might be advertising on the General Mills basis, it still goes down to Wheaties and Yoplait and all their other myriad brands. And so we just think that's a way that we can move from kind of corporate positions and brand positions and bring them together into something new that really does fit all the USFRA kind of tenets that we've been pushing for a decade now. Just really, where should we be going and what are the responsible and long-term sustainable moves to make? And so and this if, is overwhelming sometimes because you know, and this just went through thousands of data points and what he was sharing. So the Friday by noon email breaks that down every week into very, as, as we say, snackable content um, into an email that you just, you end your week with it and just do a quick scroll of what are the things that came up in seven days of analysis that we've done for that week? What do you really need to know that might drive your business? And it's an easy email to sign up for. You just go to betarudder.com um, backslash four forces just to sign up for that distillation um, of all those data points we're looking at. And that was exactly the question I was going to ask you is how does a farmer or rancher get the Friday by noon email. Uh, so Jody, Dennis, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for all your hard work for USFRA and for all the food industry and all of ag. And thank you for being on Farm Food Facts. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action would like to recognize the sponsors of the 2020 Honor the Harvest Forum. Our movement sponsors, United Soybean Board and National Pork Board. Our presenting sponsors, Wells Fargo and Cargo. Our gold sponsors, Bayer, Dairy West, Nebraska Soybean Board, McDonald's, Nutrien, and the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Our bronze sponsors, Purina and Ernst & Young. Our youth sponsor, Ruan. And our donor sponsor, Tyson. For more information on all things food and agriculture, please visit us at usfarmersandranchers.org. Also be sure to look out for us on Facebook at US Farmers and Ranchers and on Twitter at USFRA. Until next time.